الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا مما بعد We welcome you again uh, for these late night khatras from Valley Ranch Islamic Center in which we discuss together with Sheikh Omar Suleiman um, the book of Imam Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala Uddat al-Sabirin wa Dakhirat al-Shakirin The Excellence of Patience and Gratitude and tonight inshallah we are going to be reading from uh, um, briefly from chapter 11 and then chapter 12 for those who would like to follow with us uh, with their books inshallah ta'ala um, and I highly recommend for you guys, as we speak, inshallah, that you write down your gems and write down your own uh, notes with your own words. Because you're going to need them after the end of this session, inshallah ta'ala. I know in the moment of listening to the talk, it's mashallah, it sounds amazing. And you think that you're not going to forget that because it was, wow, that was really an eye-opener for me. But if you don't write it down, it's going to disappear. So I highly recommend for you to take notes, inshallah ta'ala, so that you will use them afterwards, bin uh, uh, Chapter number 11. Uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala speaking about fil farq bayna sabru al-kirami wa sabru al-li'am. He says the difference between the, the patience of the honorable ones and the dishonorable one, the mean ones basically. Like what's the difference between those who are honorable when, they, when it comes to patience? How can you tell that you are one of those people when they are, are reflected with a calamity, when they are tested, that you count among the honorable ones? Uh, versus those who, when they are tested, they just kind of like they lose it. What's the difference? So he mentioned a few things, rahimahullah ta'ala. قال كل أحد لا يبد أن يصبر على بعض ما يكره. Everybody has to be patient uh, against things that they dislike. You're not going to always like what you go through. So you're going to have to be patient at some point for things that you dislike. قال إما اختيارا وإما اضطرارا. Voluntarily or voluntarily. Whether you like it or otherwise, you are going to be tested with things that you will dislike. So, فالكريم, the honorable one, will be patient by choice, meaning voluntarily. Because this person would recognize the outcome, would recognize the ramification of being patient. Like I know the result of being patient because I have the knowledge for that. And again, we keep emphasizing about the importance of knowledge that you practice to strengthen your iman that will keep you patient in moments of difficulty. So then he says, قال, وَأَنَّهُ يُحْمَدُ عَلَيْهِ وَيُذَمُّ عَلَى الْجَزَعِ Because as a being, of course, being a, an honorable person, you will be uh, um, praised for being patient, and you will be kind of criticized and blamed for just panicking and lose it. وَأَنَّهُ إِنْ لَمْ يَصْبِرْ لَمْ يَرُدُّ الْجَزَعُ, لم يرد الجزع عَلَيْهِ فَائِتَ And he knows, the honorable one, the knowledgeable one, knows that even if I panic and I start losing it, that is not going to change anything for me. It's not going to bring me what I lost, and then guys make me attain uh, what I'm trying to get if, if, it's gonna, if it's gone completely. Then he moved to the other person, قال, as for the other one, قال, make a comparison. العاقل, and Sheikh, I want you to comment on this for us, inshallah ta'ala. قال, العاقل, عند لزول المصيبة, يفعل ما يفعله الأحمق بعد شهر. The sensible person, the reasonable person, he says, he acts on the moment, on the strike of the calamity, what the foolish does after a month. You guys understand what does that mean? The sensible person at the strike of a calamity, they're very comp well composed, they hold themselves, you know, uh, uh, properly. That, is ha that happens with the foolish one a month later. After they lose everything and then they remember, just like, oh my God, khalas, astaghfirullah, alhamdulillah, rabbi. We, so we, we go patience right now. So what do you think about this, Sheikh? Yeah, to you, قول Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, an al ghadab, qal awalahu junoon wa akhiruhu nadam. Uh, Ali radiallahu anhu has a very powerful statement about uh, anger, people that have a hot temper. He says that the beginning of it is madness, is insanity, and the end of it is regret. So in the beginning, you blow up, you act you know, in a way that's completely unrecognizable even to yourself. And then once you calm down, then you're in a state of regret. So a person who is wise, who is aqil, who has, uh, and notice here the, the idea here of al-aqil. Once again, uqulihim, we talked about this yesterday, right? Uh, Qatada rahimahullah did not say qulubihim, that the difference between us and the animals is the heart. He said uqulihim, your intellect. And so you have to know at a time of that strike that the way that you act in that moment is not just going to be to your benefit or to your detriment in the sense of the hereafter, but it's also going to be, you know, uh, largely governed by your ability to still maintain perspective. So perspective at the time of patience. What is your perspective in those moments? 
Other people come to the realization when it's too late. So they do all the damage in the world, and then afterwards, because they were unable to control themselves in the moment, they spend a much longer time trying to undo the damage that they caused in that moment of impatience. Yeah. He mentioned another example of the difference between an honorable person and a dishonorable person when it comes to the subject of patience. Mm -hmm. The wise person, the sensible person, the honorable person, he perseveres in patience in regards to uh, his obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like they hold themselves you know, tight in these moments when it comes to waking up for Fajr, a fa a, a fasting during the month of Ramadan, and dealing with, with hardships and difficulties for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They stay patient. And the other person becomes so uh, patient on, 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 on disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeying the shaitan. And he gives examples because sometimes you find some of those that are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they exercise patience on, exer on, on, on fulfilling the ma'asiyah and following their desires in a way that it will make you, you'll be astonished and surprised about the energy they put, the energy they put just to fulfill their desires, which is of course the obedient to a shaitan, disobedience to a Rahman. So that's one of the major difference between those who are honorable and otherwise. Shaykh, can I comment here? Please. One of the things about this is ta'ala, going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with both your desires and your difficulties. One of the things about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he teaches us, Arihna biha ya Bilal, comfort us with it, O Bilal. If you were to walk into the masjid and you saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in sajda crying, you could say that something really bad just happened to him or something really good just happened. And you might be right in both of those situations because the Prophet sallallahu would flee back to salah with both a ni'mah as well as a bala, with both a, a, a good thing that came to him as well as a hardship that came to him. It drove him back to that place of sajda sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It drove him back to that salah. And so taking refuge in something familiar, that's why the ulama mentioned, for example, al-wudu. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned to a person who is in anger, and I want you to think about this. The last time you got into an argument and you said, let me go make wudu. No, seriously. Like, it's like all the things are there in the sunnah, but if, if you're already used to making wudu at fajr, when it's very difficult, and you're doing it right, then it's a familiar place for you. So when you start to see yourself getting a little bit heated over something, let me go make wudu right now. Because that's what your usual refuge is. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that if a person starts to find themselves getting angry, what should they say? A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim. What should you say as well? Ida massahum ta'ifu min shaytan, imma yanzaghannaka min shaytan, if shaytan pokes you with a desire. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim. What do you say when you start your salah? A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim. Right? So the outcome is a ruju' ila Allah, is coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you don't have a familiarity with struggling, to get yourself to come back to Allah on a regular basis, then you're not going to resort to the unfamiliar in the midst of a sudden desire or a sudden difficulty or something that suddenly uh, stokes your, your impatience. Now, so the summary of, the, of this chapter, chapter 11, which is a very short chapter as a matter of fact, the summary of this is he's saying, look, when it comes to being patient, is nothing unique for the believer. It is not unique to those who are devotees, just the true worshipers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both the obedient and disobedient can be patient. However, for the wrong reason or the right reason. And as a believer, you're going to need to make sure that when you are exercise patience, you're doing it for the right reason. So whenever you're afflicted with a calamity or dealing with some temptations, anything like that, ask yourself the question, I'm trying to restrain myself. For what reason? Am I doing this to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to please somebody else? Am I doing this because that's going to draw me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or this is because, you know what, it's going to give me name or fame or whatever that is? Ask yourself that question. So being patient is not just a virtue for the believer, unless it is, of course, done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, being patient can be done by anybody else. So that's the summary of this chapter that he's talking about. So now the next chapter, inshallah, we're going to be... Mumkin, mumkin no. akhir al -safha. Akhir yeah, in chapter 11. Uh, uh, ta'ala, yawm al-qiyamah. The end of 11, the last lines. Oh, the last lines. Qanam. So he says, at the end of the chapter, in summary, he says, So he says, 
فهو أصبر شيء على التبدل التبدل في طاعة الشيطان ممراد نفسه وأعجز شيء عن الصبر على ذلك في الله وهذا أعظم اللؤم ولا يكون صاحبه كريم عند الله ولا يقوم مع أهل الكرم إذا نودي بهم يوم القيامة على رؤوس الأشهاد ليعلم أهل الجمع من أولى بالكرم اليوم أين المتقون so subhanallah the end of this is a beautiful scene that he gives and that's why I really wanted to put this before we get into the techniques of patience where he mentions rahimahullah ta'ala that day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates certain people above the rest and when people are on their knees on the day of judgment when every ummah when every nation is on its knees Allah azza wa jal says where are the people who deserve to be honored now and it's going to be the people that were patient in the face of fools and the people that were patient in the face of tribulations. صَابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who has uh, that compensation that's due upon me that no one else could give them? All right, stand up. Let me reward you now. And also those who forgave, Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions on that day, when every ummah is on, when every ummah is on its knees, Allah subhanahu wa taala will call those people who forgave others for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala to stand up so He can reward them in front of the gathering. So this is a beautiful way that He ends this chapter. If you want to be that person who's told to stand up on the day of judgment, so that everyone in the assembly can know who Ahlul Karam are, who the noble people are, who the honorable people are, then strive to do the noble things that no one else will appreciate in this life. No one else is going to congratulate you. No one else is going to tell you great job. No one else is going to pay you for that. But strive for that moment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to rise above everybody else as a person of nobility for those noble manners. So now that we know that when it comes to patience, um, the, the righteous and the non-righteous can be patient, but for different reasons, obviously. So how can I acquire the, the, the techniques? Uh, what are the techniques I need to acquire in order for me to start becoming patient for the right reason? This is the next chapter, chapter number 12. Imam uh, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, qala fil asbab allati tu'inu ala sabr. These are the techniques, these are the, the, the methods by which you can acquire patience, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to read in the Arabic, and Shaykh, inshallah, you can do it in English, bin Allah azza wa jal. Qal, lamma kana sabr ma'muran bihi, ja'ala Allah subhanahu lahu asbaban tu'inu alayhi wa tusilu ilayhi. وكذلك ما أمر الله سبحانه بالأمر إلا أعان عليه ونصب له أسبابا تمده وتعين عليه كما أنه ما قدر داء إلا وقدر له دواء أو ضمن الشفاء باستعماله. So this is essentially, and I'm going to change the translation a bit. So when you're reading it from a book, it might be a little bit different. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah actually has a book called Adda wa Dawa, and that's you know the, the, the disease and its cure. And one of the things that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah does beautifully is he says that this is not just physical diseases, but it's also spiritual diseases. Allah has not created a, a disease except that he created a cure. So when you have a spiritual disease, you have a spiritual cure for it that exists as well. So here he says, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded his servants to be patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also prescribed for them the means by which they can attain that patience. And this is the methodology of Allah Allah never asks you to do something without giving you the means by which he can uh, help you, without aiding you in seeking to achieve it, without setting up the methodology or the means by which you will be supported, and without providing a way for you to carry it out with ease. Allah did not create an illness, but except that he created a cure for it as well, and ensured through its usage a cure. He continues by saying, قَالَ فَالصَّبْرُ وَإِنْ كَانَ شَاقًا كَرِيهًا عَلَى النُّفُوسِ فَتَحْصِيلُهُ مُمْكِنْ وهو يتركب من مفردين العلم والعمل فمنهما تركب جميع الأدوية التي تداوى بها القلوب والأبدان فلا بد من جزء, من جزء علمي وجزء عملي فمنهما يركب هذا الدواء الذي هو أنفع الأدوية So he says that while exercising patience is certainly difficult and unpleasant for us it's still achievable uh, You're not going to get anything in life that is meaningful without having some level of sacrifice. So he's saying, of course, patience is difficult, but it also is achievable. And he says, patience has two elements. It has knowledge and it has practice. And these two are the essential ingredients of all medicines, which aid in the treatment of both the heart as well as the body. And from these two ingredients is the medicine of patience prepared. And I just want to remind everyone yesterday 
we mentioned the saying that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah quotes from Imam Abdul Qadir rahimahullah ta'ala in Futuh al-Ghayb that there are three levels of acceptance of patience. Number one, an obligation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded. So you accept it here. You submit yourself to it. You don't try to undermine the obligation. That's the first level of patience. Number two, a prohibition that Allah has commanded you to abstain from. Number three, a divine decree that Allah has commanded you to accept. So acceptance is the first level. And now you want to strive to a place where you submit yourself to it and you're patient with it as well. I want to just also remind ourselves you know, from uh, the past few nights we were talking about the importance of knowledge. Let's, let's try that again so we can understand how we can really exercise patience. And now even Qayyim Rahim Allah is going to explain that even further more, the importance of knowledge when it comes to being patient. He said that when it comes to uh, the calamity, at the time of the calamity, people become completely heedless of that knowledge that they have. So what keeps people firm at time of calamity? Do you guys remember? What keeps people firm? The, 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 the strength of their iman. The strength of their iman. Okay, uh, how do you acquire, how do you make your iman strong? What do you need for that? Practice. Practice of what? Of your knowledge. Okay, so then what does that mean when it comes to knowledge? How much knowledge do you need? The more the better. Because Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Those who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are conscious of Allah azza wa jal are the ulama, the, the, those who have the knowledge. So I need to become that person so I can practice that knowledge to strengthen my iman. So when I deal with any difficulty, I know how to handle this. Because Ibn Qayyim says over here, look, Allah made it very clear, you're going to be tested. And because he said you're going to be tested with hardships and difficulties and otherwise, he also says that I'm not testing you with something you cannot bear, you cannot handle. Just like I'm giving you what the test is going to look like, I'm also helping you with the means by which you can go through it. So my job and your job is to do what? To learn. What are the techniques that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for us out there by which I can handle any hardship, any difficulty I go through? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And protect your livelihood and protect your families, Ya Rabbil Alameen. If someone loses a job, they start agonizing. There's a way they need to be patient in regard to this difficulty. Someone has a trouble in their marriage, with their children, with their health, with their iman, all these things. Everybody has a, a degree of hardship they're dealing with. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also had given us means by which we can acquire patience against all these trials. So instead of sitting out there just kind of whining and crying about why am I being tested, what do I need to do? Find that knowledge that help you, inshallah, to strengthen your iman in a moment like this, you know how to handle it. And that's what he's going to be talking about right now. So he says, Remember, he said, two major ingredients for that. Knowledge and practice. So he says, Remember, <laughs> كما ينبغي أضاف إليهما العزيمة الصادقة والهمة العالية والنخوة والمروءة الإنسانية وضم هذا الجزء إلى هذا الجزء فمتى فعل ذلك حصل له الصبر وهانت عليه ما شاقه وحلت له مرارته وانقلب ألمه لذة نعم شيخ So um, these are hard terms obviously to translate but knowledge includes knowing he says knowing the benefits the advantage the pleasure and the excellence that the ordained act carries within it. It also invo involves realizing the evil, the harm, and the damage that are found within that haram. So basically knowing the benefits of the good deed and knowing the harm of the prohibited act. When a person understands these two things, when he has full knowledge of these two things, then he'll be able to have proper dedication, uh, noble intention, human dignity, and a sense of honor. And we're talking about here al-azima. Uh, this idea of commitment here and ambition, what that really reflects is that you're not simply going to say to yourself that, okay, I, I, I know that this is what I need to do, but you're going to have a certain level of commitment to achieving that particular intention. And he said, once you put all of these elements together, then you're going to be able to acquire the quality of patience. You will endure life's troubles with patience. You will bear its bitterness and you will start to feel that its pain turns into pleasure. 
Sheikh, my, my comment on this issue, subhanAllah. We live in a time that whole concept of human, of the issue of dignity and the issue of, uh, of honor and uh, uh, keeping yourself clear from any suspicion among the people, all of that used to be much more valuable in the past than it is today. In a culture that promotes you know, self-expression uh, uh, and whatever you want to be and be genuine to yourself and so on, sometimes what we consider to be dignity is no longer something that is dignified to many, many people. And that brings me to the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu which is used today as an example of how things shifted in terms of recognizing what evil is evil and the consequence of doing that back in the day was something we, we, are, we are aware of. Today people just kind of like forget it. So the hadith when, the, when a man uh, came, a young man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I love everything about Islam, he said, Walakin i'dhan li fi zina. Can you give me permission to fornicate? Like, I can't, I can't stop this. I, I can't, you know, live without that. So the Prophet Sallallahu gently he approached him and he put his hand on his chest and he said, Qal, atardaha li ummik. Do you like that for your mom? He goes, no. Atardaha li ukhtik. Do you like this for your sister? He goes, of course not. He was asking about, you know, the, family, the female members of his family. And to each one of them, this young man, he would say, no. He's so dignified and he's so offended even that the thought might cross his mind that his wife, his, his mom, his sister could be used in that fashion. So the Prophet then told him, The same thing, people don't like this to their own sisters and mothers and, and so on. So the man eventually kind of like, came to me to, to understand that this is bad, this is wrong, the consequences can be also detrimental to me and my family, and he quit that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed that from his heart. That same hadith tried to mention it today to somebody from in our time. Someone you go to them said, look, atardaha li ummik, what would he tell you today? That's none of my business. <laughs> atardaha li ukhtik, they would say, well, that, she's an adult, she can do whatever she wants to do. And literally, this is actually, it, it, it truly happened. It's not just a metaphor. It truly happened. When someone tried to use the same hadith to ask this person to be patient against the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, against these sins, it failed. Why? Because the concept of dignity, Sheikh, has changed in our time. What is considered honorable has also changed and shifted as well. And that is why knowledge is extremely important because what he said, rahimahullah, over here, when you recognize when you recognize with that knowledge the value of this patience, the, how, the value, the consequence of staying patient against these matters, and also when you recognize the evil if you do that, but how do you recognize this is to be evil or otherwise? That's where knowledge comes in, because I have to go back to the measuring stick that we talked about in the first night, which is what? The Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. That proper knowledge will help me recognize what's right, what's wrong, what's dignified, what's not, and based on that, I will develop that knowledge and that iman and restrain from these from these matters. Now, you want to go to the sure. Number one. Yeah. Sure. Now he is trying to give us uh, some practical tips, basically on how you could do that. Qala, rahimahullah taala. So the, the idea, he says, look, you have knowledge and practice. Put them together with the human dignity and being, of course, you know, uh, uh, having that himma and the intention to do right. Put them together, you will be able to be patient, inshallah taala. Then he gave some. Uh, uh, practical tips. قال فإذا عزم على التداوي ومقاومة هذا الداء فليضعفه أولا بأمور. Now he's talking about if you're gonna start using this medication or medicine and resist these uh, uh, these uh, shahwar and these sins and so on, then you need to weaken that that disease with these matters. Number one, أن ينظر إلى مادة قوة الشهوة فيجدها فيجدها من الأغذية المحركة للشهوة إما بنوعها أو بكميتها وكثرتها ليحسم هذه المادة بتقليلها فإن لم تنحسم فليبادر إلى الصوم فإنه يضعف مجاري الشهوة ويكسر حدتها ولا سيما إذا كان أكله وقت الفطر معتدلا The first one I think it's uh, different here in the translation I have a different translation What I have here is the strength of uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too high to be disobeyed when he is seeing and hearing. It's a different translation. Then. Let me explain this point in the so, Firmukh so, so. so what he says over here, um, he said, look at what really feeds that desire. What feeds that desire? Let's be real. For example, may Allah subhanahu wa protect us all pornography, for instance, watching something haram. What feeds that desire? That's what he's saying. What is it exactly? قال, then because if you keep feeding it, it gets stronger. It gets stronger and stronger and intense, even more. 
فيجدها من الأغذية المحركة للشهوة. You'll find that, that whatever you feed that desire will definitely going to move it and keep it active in your life. So watching things, for example, putting yourself in the wrong company, uh, exposing yourself to music that is always praising these kind of behaviors and, and practices, all these things will definitely going to feed that desire and make it more intense and stronger so people find it easy to fall for it and harder even to resist that. So what he's saying over here, you need to learn, قال, you need to practice fasting. Now he's speaking about fasting in two ways. The physical fasting, which what the Prophet Sallallahu recommending for us, and also the metaphoric expression of fasting, which means to restrain yourself and control yourself from falling into any of these temptations, like stay away from that. Fasting, by abstaining from eating and drinking, obviously would kind of like weaken that desire, and also fasting by staying away from these matters that feeds the shahwa and make it strong for us. So that's the first thing he was talking about, Sheikh Na, in number yeah, one. So he has, he, has a, he has three that he mentions here, and then no. he has the 20 tips that he has. Yes. So uh, this one, I found it actually in no. the translation as well. So uh, I think this idea here of uh, not exposing yourself, and this is actually something that the ulama of Teskia talk about quite a bit even if you think that you're immune to something, don't expose yourself to something that might cause you weakness, and especially if you have a weakness. And they also mentioned that even if something is not necessarily haram, it's not necessarily prohibited, if it's going to compound a vulnerability that you have, then try to keep yourself away from it, even if it falls within the realm of that which is permissible. No. No, no, number two, he says, قال والثاني. So the first thing he says, Look for the nutrition or the, the things that would strengthen your shahwa and stay away from it. The second thing قال والثاني أن يجتنب محرك الطلب وهو النظر أن يجتنب محرك الطلب وهو النظر فليقصر لجام طرفه ما أمكنه فإن داعي الإرادة والشهوة إنما يهيج بالنظر والنظر يحرك القلب بالشهوة وفي المسند مسند الإمام أحمد رحمه الله قال النظر سهم مسموم من سهام إبليس so this is actually a really important point uh, because it especially relates to our time right now. He's saying that the second thing speaks to your gaze, your eyesight, what you look at. And so a person should avoid the causes of desire, particularly what you look at. And you should rein in your eyes as much as possible because your desire is going to be stimulated by what you're uh, looking at. So he says, looking stir stirs the heart with lust. And the Prophet says, the glance is a poisoned arrow of the shaitan. And by the way, this is not just talking about looking at someone of the opposite gender or looking at, you know, uh, immodesty and things of that sort. This is anything that stirs within you the possibility of leading you to a haram place. So let's say, for example, you're someone who gossips a lot. Don't stare at the things that are going to don't stare at the things that are going to cause gossip to naturally be the next step for you. If you're someone that is very materialistic, don't stare at things that are of that same material that's going to drive within you something. If you're someone who becomes prone to envy and self-pity, don't look at the ni'am that other people have, the blessings that other people have, and, stir, and, and stare at them too long because that's going to naturally provoke inside of you a means by which shaitan can put a feeling, a desire that is not praiseworthy and take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, subhanAllah, Imam Ibn Qayyim afterwards, he explains the same principle in a beautiful way, in a very visual way. He goes, look, since he says that a saham, a nadar, looking is one of the, the errors of the shaitan that he throws at you, basically, he calls, He says, he means by that, that a shaitan, he throws that error at you, and if you're not paying attention, and you're not having a shield, it will hit you. If you don't you shield yourself with patience, it will hit you. قال وليس الجنة إلا غض الطرف أو التحيز والانحراف عن جهة الرمي. And he goes, he said, look, this protection, the shield that we're looking for here, the armor that you need to put uh, 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 to protect yourself, is lowering your gaze, turning away, and or even moving out of the situation. Three things: you lower your gaze, turn away completely, turn your body away or actually run out of the situation altogether. So this is, these are the armors that you need to protect yourself from falling into the fitna of looking. فَإِنَّهُ إِنَّمَا يَرْمِي هَذَا السَّهْمْ عَنْ قَوْسِ الصور. He goes, his bow is the, the images. 
And those arrows he throws from that bow of imaging and of course seeing all these things. Like we are attracted to that sight. فَإِذَا لَمْ تَقِفْ عَلَىٰ طَرِيقِهَا أَخْطَأَ السَّهْمِ If you were not in the way of these arrows, then he's going to miss you. But if you expose yourself and put yourself on the way of these arrows, it's going to hit you. And that reminds me, Shaykh, with the ayat uh, Surah Al-A'raf, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke um, from the beginning of the creation of Adam. As shaytan he made one of his goals, one of his goals, of course, to tempt the, the children of Adam with the, with the matters of the eyes. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to us about how Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree, right? What was the first thing that they had to deal with? First, وَسَلَهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ لِيُبْدِيَ لَهُمَا مَا وُرِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنْ سَوْآتِهِمَا Shaytan kept whispering to them, tempting them about eating from the tree, in order for him to cause them to see what was hidden from their eyes. And these are the awrat. And that's why when the moment they ate, they ate from the tree, what happened? They found themselves exposed, and they, uh, they start taking from the leaves of the, of the trees and trying to cover their shame. Few ayat later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, la yaftinannakum ash-shaytanu kama akhraj abawaykum min al-jannah. O oh, children of Adam, don't be like forefathers when the shaytan, your father Adam, when he tempted you, uh, tempted him and he took him out of Jannah. How? قال ينزع عنهما لباسهما ليريهما سوآتهما. He was doing, he, all his effort was about them to be exposed so they could look at each other. And frankly, in our time, Sheikh, I think one of the biggest fitna, the biggest trials, which is, doesn't sound like it's, a, it's something as uh, heavy to many people, but in reality, it's a soft fitna, but the impact, it's probably the heaviest on many, many young men and women today, the fitna of the, of the, of the images. Looking and falling into the haram, whether it's something in the streets, something on TV, on their phone, on social media, it just, the fitna is so great. Allahumma sta'an. And it, it gives some perspective to as-sabru fihin qabdin ala al-jamr. When the Prophet mentions that, min wara'ikum, he's telling the companions that there are days that will come after you that patience is going to be like holding on to a burning hot coal. Now, if, you, if you're really being honest with yourself, we're not tested like the companions when it comes to hardship. Right? The companions were tested with bala in ways that none of us could ever imagine ourselves being tested with. Could any of us ever bear what the family of Ammar went through? Uh, Yasir and, and uh, Sumayya, may Allah be pleased with them. Could any of us bear what the companions went through in Badr and Uhud and Khandaq? We couldn't bear those types of trials. The trial of having to literally make hijrah to escape persecution, escape death, the trial of the boycott. But the ulama mentioned in this hadith that as-sabru fihim, that the, the patience in those days is like holding on to a burning hot coal, is referring to the sabr of shahwa, the sabr of desire, more so because the access to those desires becomes far more readily available. And subhanAllah, you think about that burning hot coal literally being your phone in your hand. You don't have to go far to see what is going to tempt you at this point. And again, temptation is not just looking at the indecency of other people. It's looking at things in general that stir in you something that will distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the Prophet sallallahu talks about a person walking on the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that there are doors on both sides of that path, and there's a curtain. That's the sitr. That's the curtain. And there's a shaitan on top of each one of those curtains that's telling you to come in. And there's another caller on top of that shaitan that's telling you, don't come in. And so you're constantly battling the temptation to open the curtain. Once you open the curtain, at the bare minimum, your casualty is your time. You've wasted a lot of time, right? And that in and of itself is a cost because you could have been generating something that is greater. And so that shield that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is talking about, it's two things as the ulama mentioned. Number one, a dhikr. Number one is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the Prophet speaks about as the fortress of the Muslim. Because shaitan can't enter a place where Allah is remembered. He can't enter a tongue where Allah is being remembered. He can't penetrate your thoughts if Allah is being remembered. He can't penetrate your heart if you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's remembrance in those moments. So to have a dhikr as a means of keeping the shaitan away. Number two are the practical means that you take to put barriers between you and those sins. Imposing self-restriction Barriers between you and those sins, barriers between you and those things that you know are going to stir 
certain elements inside of you that are not praiseworthy and that could take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he speaks on what number three. So he said, the first medicine is when you understand that you need to do abstinence. The second thing is when you remove yourself from the location of the fitna. The third one قال, تَسْلِيَةٌ نَفْسِ بِالْمُبَاحِ الْمُعَوُّذِ عَنِ الْحَرَامِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مَا يَشْتَهِيهِ الطَّبْعِ فَفِيمَا أَبَاحَهُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ غُنْيَةٌ عَنْهِ وَهَذَا هُوَ الدَّوَاءُ النَّافِعِ فِي حَقِّ أَكْثَرِ النَّاسِ كَمَا أَرْشَدَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ So, he says that the, the third thing is that a person should try to fulfill their desires through permissible means instead of prohib prohibited ways because the desirable things can be achieved through the means that are allowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is a useful cure for the majority of people as the Prophet sallallahu uh, advised us. He mentioned in summary, basically like he's wrapping up right now these three things. Because for him, I believe, he maybe thought that, look, he said, there are three most important things. If you can comprehend these three things, you will save yourself a lot of troubles. What are these three things? Remember them. He says, al-awwal, al-dawa al-awwal, the first medicine. يَشْبَهُ قَطْعَ الْعَلَفِ عَنِ الدَّابَةِ الْجَمُوحِ وَعَنِ الْكَلْبِ الضَّارِ لِضْعَافِ قُوَّتِهِمَا he said, this is, it looks like when you, um, when you prevent an animal from uh, uh, the harmful uh, 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 hay or food. Same thing when you restrain a dog from, you know, from going wild in that regard. He said, this is it exactly. So the first medicine that you guys need to try it is abstinence. You know this is haram, stay away from it. So abstinence, like I'm not gonna do it. No matter how strong the call to do this, I'm going to restrain myself and abstain from doing that. So the first is abstinence. The second thing, قال والدواء الثاني يشبه تغييب اللحم عن الكلب والشعير عن البهيمة لألا تتحرك قوتهما له عند المشاهدة. He says, removing yourself from the circumstances that will cause your shahwa, your desire, to become strong and pursue that, that, uh, that sin. What does that mean? If you're going to always look at your phone and you have all these apps on your phone, Chances to fall for it is, is easier than when you, when you remove all these uh, accounts and close all these accounts and so on. Because don't throw the, the meat in front of the dog and expect the dog just to, uh, um, uh, not to try to fight you over it. He's the same thing. Don't put this, uh, don't give your, your nafs an access to the shahwal and then try to expect it to be, you know, uh, uh, honorable about it. The third thing he says, الثالث <laughs> Because the third one is just like when you, when you ration nutrition to your body. Just because something is halal does not necessarily mean I have to indulge to the maximum. Because if you do that, you might get sick. Too much of sweets, too much of, you know, of, of, of carbs or whatever. Still it's halal but it might hurt you. He said the same thing over here. That you know, you can eat this, you can eat that, you have to ration yourself in regard to the subject of halal as well. And that's something Shaykh Omar mentioned earlier. He says, look, I mean, uh, just because something is halal doesn't mean that I have to always practice this to the maximum. Because if you, ha if you have, if get used to the halal, your nafs is gonna start looking for something beyond that. Get used to it. Khalas, I mean, that's why some of the ulama, they used to, um, they used to actually restrain themselves from some of the halal matters so that the nafs always desire halal. Otherwise, if you go 100% with the halal, everything is halal, you just practice this, then your nafs are desiring something beyond the halal. Do you want to get to the 20 uh, tips? 20? Yeah, yeah. He has the 20 techniques. And ta'alam an Allah Azza wa Jal. Not to do dua, inshallah. It's ba'id in Allah. No, I don't, ha I don't okay. have it here. Inshallah, if you want to find the, I'll, I'll, I'll share some, if you want to find where this is, inshallah. Time. inshallah. So subhanAllah, one of the things that m that's mentioned here, and actually I was thinking about this last night, and Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah gives 20 techniques in particular where a person can start to discipline. You have to think about two things according to Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. Broadly, how do you conquer the initial moment? You conquer, you conquer the initial moment with a greater motivation, and how do you conquer the constant pull? You conquer the constant pull with an instant mechanism. So the greater motivation, you know, when they say give up what you want now for what you want more, وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ You want something that other people don't want. 
You want something that other people don't want. So what is the greater motivation that you have? So you have to immediately be able to resort to that instant motivation, to that greater motivation. And then you have to have a mechanism that's automatic to govern it, to channel that. If you're trying to find a mechanism in that moment, then it's not going to work. So whether it is, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم, when I get angry, you know? The Prophet ﷺ, when he saw the person that was losing his mind and losing his temper and he was getting into this fight, the Prophet ﷺ did not walk up to him and say to him, say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. He called other people forward and he said, listen, I know something that if he was to say it, it would do away with his anger. If he said, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. Why? Because if any of you tried saying to someone in the middle of an argument, hey, صلي على النبي, you know, say astaghfirullah, say a'udhu billahi minash shaytan rajim, how does that go for you? It never really goes well, right? When you try to tell someone in the moment because they didn't have the mechanism already figured out on their own. You can't teach someone a mechanism in the middle of their impatience. They have to already have learned those mechanisms in advance. And what you'll notice from the Prophet is that there's always a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resort to and then a greater motivation uh, to keep in mind. Uh, so we have that, that, uh, some of the techniques Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala speaking about in order to strengthen your, uh, your knowledge of the deen that will help you shield yourself against his muharramat. But I just want to remind myself and my brothers and sisters over here that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah says, look, the solution is simple, three things. Number one, Abstinence, stay away from the muharramat, knowing that this is wrong, I need to stay away from it. Number two, remove yourself from the circumstances that will strengthen the shahwa and cause you to fall into the haram. And number three, look for something halal as an alternative that you can inshallah ta'ala uh, do, but also make sure to ration, you know, the use of it or the usage of it so that your nafs doesn't get bored too quickly with the halal. Three simple things. That should be our now inshallah ta'ala, our goal of how we do that. Now. How can, I, how can I make it easy for me to follow this path? How can I make it easy for me? That's when he says, Remember, he says the solution or the ingredients for the medicine are two, knowledge and practice. So how can I strengthen my knowledge in my deen that would help me build that shield to protect you from the haram? So he mentioned here 20 points actually. إجلال الله تبارك وتعالى أن يعصى وهو يرى ويسمع ومن قام بقلبه مشهد إجلاله لم يطاوعه قلبه لذلك البتة. So this is now, I think, subhanallah, the cream of just this this entire chapter. This is where you get to really the meat of it. And inshallah ta'ala, those of you that are taking notes, I want you to consider each and every single one of these inshallah ta'ala. Number one, realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too great to be disobeyed and he's looking at you and he is listening to you and whoever has this reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this ijlal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their heart will never be willing to defy their orders. This is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kama tastahi min al-rajul salih I actually gave a khutbah about this recently. Be shy of Allah the way that you're shy of a righteous person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sight upon you, you know that he sees you, you know that he hears you, and Allah is too great in your heart to be disobeyed in the moment. Therefore, the pull and the attraction of that particular sin is not going to be significant anymore. Hence, you have the, the saying of Ibrahim al-Adham, rahimahullah, where someone asked him for permission to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, fine, if you're going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disobey Allah in a place he can't see you. He said, but Allah always sees me. He said, okay, fine, D if you're going to disobey Allah, disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a place that doesn't belong to him. But it all belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well fine, at least have the decency then, if you're going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't use the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's given to you to disobey him with. And you think about that and you're like, wow, like if I'm in someone's house and they're watching me in their home, I have the decency, there's a sense of, of decency that I'm not going to do the things that would upset the host in their own home, using their own blessings. So how is it when you are a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a place that he created, using the blessings that he created while he is watching you to disobey him? And so start with that, that ijlal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala chose this uh, to be the first thing because it goes in line with what the Prophet sallallahu mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel. 
when he was asked about Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. The journey that you go through from being a Muslim to being a Mu'min to being a Muhsin, he's basically like summarizing what Ihsan is in these few words. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the beginning of Surah Tabarak, Alladhi biyadihu al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, what did he say? Alladhi khalaq al-mawta wal-hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala. The one who created death and life to try you, who's going to be best or most excellent in their deeds. It's all about being excellent in your deeds. Okay, so what is, how does that look like? The Prophet explained that. قَالْ أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَنَّكَ تَرَهُ That you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you're absolutely certain that you see Him. If not with the sight of your eyes, then the sight of your mind and your heart. That you absolutely see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, If you couldn't get to that level of certainty, then you're absolutely certain that he sees you. Those two degrees of certainty, you're absolutely certain that you see him, and if you couldn't get to that level, then at least you're absolutely certain that he sees you. This is what Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah speak about over here. He goes, look, that's the level of ihsan. The first thing you need to keep in mind, how can I get with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the level of ihsan? By ijdalullahi tabaraka wa ta'ala, you know, understanding your position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that no matter how much you try to disobey Allah azza wa jal, Allah is watching you. And if you can get to that level, you'll abstain. Number two, qal al-thani, mashhadu mahabbatihi subhana, mashhadu mahabbatihi subhana, fa yatruku ma'asiyatahu mahabbatan lah, fa inna al-muhibba lima yuhibbu muti' wa afdalu al-tarki tarku al-muhibbin كما أن أفضل الطاعة طاعة المحبين فبين ترك المحب وطاعته وترك من يخاف العذاب وطاعته بون بعيد بون بعيد نعم الله أكبر سبحان الله this is the most beautiful of the twenty in my opinion uh, if you lose everything else that we've spoken about here سبحان الله this is such a beautiful and profound point he says to look at the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to allow that to be the means by which you shun disobedience, your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> and he says that a lover surrenders in obedience to the beloved. And the best renouncement is that of the lover, and the best obedience is the obedience of the lover. And he says there's a huge difference between the two, the one who renounces and obeys out of love and the one who renounces and obeys out of fear of punishment. SubhanAllah, this is the level of the Sahaba of the Prophet So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says about Suhaib al-Rumi, قَالَ لَوْ لَا يَخَافُ اللَّهُ لَمْ يَعْصِهِ I love this thing. He said, even if he didn't fear Allah, he would never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too much. You're not going to be able to conquer the moment of patience without personalizing your relationship with Allah. You can't reduce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to just another desire. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who believe love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much more. Uh, you know, Abu Bakr al-Shibri rahimahullah ta'ala يقول سُمِّيَةُ الْمُحَبَّةِ لِأَنَّهَا تَمْحُ مِنَ الْقَلْبِ مَا سِوَى الْمَحْبُوبِ قَالَ rahimahullah ta'ala that a person, it's called mahabba, love, because it removes from the heart everything except for the object of your love. You know, when they say a person who's a lover uh, loses their mind, subhanAllah, when you love Allah too much to disobey Him, the incentive becomes secondary to that love. And you don't want to compromise that love. So it's one thing, like, I'm afraid He's going to punish me because He's looking at me right now. It's another thing, I love you too much right now to do something that would cause me to fall in your sight. And so he's saying that's the best type of ta'a, that's the best type of obedience. That's where you have to strive to, and that's where all this du'a and all this ibadah and all this salah and all this dhikr is supposed to get you to, to where you're considering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the heart of a lover, not the heart of just one who is fearful, but the heart of a lover. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala <coughs> was described um, by Salih al-Kaysan to his father, and never met a man who Allah was greater in his heart than this young man. So loving Allah becomes the greatest incentive and not compromising. Like you're, imagine like, yeah, Allah, it's you and I right now. It's you and I right now. And you find yourself in a moment where you're tempted. 
إلهي غارت النجوم ونامت العيوم وغلقت الملوك أبوابها وبابك مفتوح وخلا كل حبيب بحبيبه وهذا مقامي بين يديك. Oh my Lord, all the lovers are with their lovers now. The stars have appeared, the doors have shut, every lover is with their lover. And here I am with you, O oh Allah, I love you, O oh Allah. I'm actively engaging your sight even when I'm alone. So when I find those alone moments, I don't see myself as concealed from the creation so that now I can disobey the creator. I see myself as concealed from the creation so now I can engage that love with the creator and that's the greatest form of patience. Uh, SubhanAllah, I'm um, yeah, reflecting on uh, um, how, how sometimes we see people do crazy things out of love really. You see that online, you see that on social media, people do crazy things crazy things out of love for somebody. They're willing to do things that it compromises their dignity, compromises their safety even sometimes just to show their love. And they're willing to sacrifice so many things, so many things that they desire the most. And they're not willing to sacrifice these things for anybody unless they fall in love with someone. And whatever they ask them to do, they will do it. We've seen people quitting their jobs. We've seen people, you know, moving from one city to another, one country to another, moving from one, you know, situation to another in their lives. Why? Just following and pursuing their love. Things that anyone else asks them to do close, not even close to that, they would never actually do that. Now imagine that just with a human being, whether it's someone that you love as a lover, a parent, a child, someone that you respect, doesn't matter. But you're doing it for a man, you're doing it for a human being. And then when you have that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, I don't want you to do this. You say, out of love, definitely, Ya Rabbi. I mean, humans, they do that for humans. Can you imagine? And we, we find pleasure. We find pleasure, absolute pleasure, abstaining from, thing, from things for the sake of our lovers. Other people, they will tell you, are you serious? You're going to quit this? Like, yeah. Are you out of your mind? Maybe yes, but they're doing it for a human being. And imagine if you truly claim that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much sacrifices are you going to willing to make for his sake subhanahu wa ta'ala? What's the sacrifice you're going to make for the sake of Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يَحْبُبْكُمُ اللَّهِ You say you love Allah, prove it. As simple. He says, you, tr you say that you love Allah, as well, prove it to me. How? He says, by following the example of the Prophet wasallam. My dear brothers and sisters, the temptation in our time is crazy, Wallah, especially with social media is giving people platforms to things that they would never do in normal situations. But now because we love ourselves, we love our fame and name and we love our followers and we create, you know, titles for ourselves, God knows where they came from. And we compromise many things because we love these things for the dunya. Imagine if you have that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala embedded in your heart. Wouldn't leaving the ma'asiyah and the sin become easy? And as a matter of fact, it becomes pleasurable. And I love to fight the sin. Not that I would like to expose myself to it, but no. It becomes pleasurable to fight the shaitan for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Waking up for tahajjud becomes pleasurable. Because of just, I enjoy it. I fight the shaitan. I'm winning against them, alhamdulillah. It's pleasurable. Why? Because I want to be with my Lord, with my love, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if you think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that fashion. And I always want to be with my love, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, obeying Allah will become easy and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes so hard and difficult. So abstaining from the haram and the sins becomes so easy. So easy. Like Imam bin Qayyim was speaking about before. Depends on how strong your iman is. Other people... They don't need much effort to abstain from the haram. Because for them, they reach that level of knowledge and practice to make them know, I don't need this. I don't want to lose my connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And other people, they struggle with it. Just to stop swiping over their phone, it's just like moving mountains for them. So hard. And all what you need is what? Put your phone away. That's it. But we still keep doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and scrolling for hours. And after that, what happens? We regret for days. And then we think, alhamdulillah, okay, I'm not going to do it again. But we do it again, and again, and again. It seems that our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not where it's supposed to be. And Allah says very clearly, you claim that you love me, 
then follow my, follow, follow my messenger. Prove it to me. So I hope, inshallah, that's a message that should resonate with each and every one of us tonight, inshallah, that before we leave this masjid, I want to I wanna vacate everything in my heart and put the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. And I hope if we get to that level, that I always see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the sight of my heart and the sight of my mind. And I always watch this divine surveillance that would make me watchful of what I do and what I say. And I hope, inshallah, we'll take you all to the level of muttaqeen, ya rabbil alameen. Wallahu alam. SubhanAllah. Yeah, just uh, I was thinking of a statement from Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah. Qala kama anna laysa kamithlihi, laysa kahubbihi shay. That there is nothing like him, and there is nothing like loving him. There is nothing like him, laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like him, and there is nothing like loving him. So when you hear, وَالَّذِينَ amanu ashaddu hubban lillah, those who believe love Allah, they love Allah more than anyone else loves anything else. And the uh, truly, subhanAllah, the only way you're going to develop that relationship is through dua. You got to start talking to him. If you start talking to him, you'll start perceiving him more. And if you start perceiving him more, then you'll start loving him more. It's a natural, it's a natural sequence here. Talk to him more. Personalize your dua. So when you're making dua, Stop just reading a formula. Stop just reading a book. Get personal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then eventually, the sweetness of that is going to overwhelm you the next time that you find yourself alone. You're going to find refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than seeking refuge in whatever it is that your desire is calling you to or whatever it is that that hardship is driving you to. Inshallah, we're going to take questions right now, Bidillah. So you're going to see the QR code on the screen. Use your phone, please send your questions. And from the sisters, if you would like to make sure that your padlet is colored, we know it's coming from the sister side. Also, if anyone is watching with us nationally or internationally would like to send, inshallah, a question, uh, make sure that you identify where exactly you're sending your question from so at least we recognize you, inshallah ta'ala. And subhanAllah, we had uh, viewers watching this series, tabarakallah, from around the world. Uh, last night, I received requests and actually people were recognizing themselves from where they're coming from. Some people from Scandinavia, from Canada, from Africa, from uh, uh, Asia, from Philippines, and subhanAllah, Middle East, from all over, mashallah, watching with us here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for being here with us, ya Rabbil Alameen. Naam. And just so, inshallah, the next uh, night, there are 20 tips here, 20 techniques. We only cover two. So inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow we'll try to get through as many as we can and hopefully get through all 20. But this is really a powerful section of the book. So for those of you that are not going to be able to join us, uh, chapter 12, mm -hmm. if you can read these few pages inshallah ta'ala, then do so and reflect on them deeply. No. Uh, question says over here, what is uh, Ibn Qayyim's view uh, or yours on enduring patience but still making dua against the human, uh, the human root of those trials as did Musa alayhi salam? and other uh, prophets eventually. And does that diminish from the word of your uh, beautiful sabr and make you of a dishonorable category? You know, subhanAllah, in the Sahaba, you have sometimes refuge because you realize that there are things that they did that if you didn't know that they did, you would think that you're a lower human being and that it's impermissible. It's like when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah talks about ikhtilaf, the idea of difference of opinion, he says, Alhamdulillah, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ had differences of opinion because otherwise we'd have no excuse. When it comes to making dua against the human root, a dua al zalimin First of all, the Prophet ﷺ was not sent, he says, I was not sent as la'anan, as someone who curses. But the Prophet ﷺ made dua against people when they were in an active state of oppression to stop them from their oppression. Likewise, you find from the companions people that did make dua against them, that, those that hurt them. Uh, you find it from Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu ahad mubashirin al-jannah he's one of the ten promised paradise and there was a woman that claimed I mean this is by the way like one of the most real stories of the companions in this regard there was a woman that accused him of stealing her land and so she kept on taking her share of, of his land and eventually he made dua against her and he said Allahumma a'mi basaraha waqtulha fi ardiha O oh Allah, blind her and let her die in her land, the land that she stole. And subhanAllah, she went blind and she fell into a ditch in that land and she died. I mean, this is a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They used to fear the dua of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. 
Taqi da'wat al mazlum The Prophet says, fear the dua of the oppressed because there's no hijab between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you make dua against someone who hurts you or someone who oppresses you, that does not undermine your patience because you're being patient with Allah's answer in regards to that person. So just like with everything else, you're not hasty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, I've been making dua for two months against this person. I've been making dua for six months against this person, a year against this person. Because Musa Islam made dua against Fir'aun for decades before it came to pass. You're not hasty with that dua with, with, with that person. And lastly, you can't let making dua against a person consume all of your dua. Sometimes we, we can become so consumed by that dua against the human root of evil that we're forgetting to also find the means by which we drive ourselves towards the root of all good, as-salam, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the source of all peace. So if it's a part of your dua, it can't become all of your dua, or else it's going to overwhelm you and it's going to serve as a hindrance between you're getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I may ask from the brothers and sisters who are sending the questions, inshallah, please make sure that the questions are relevant to the topic we discussed. Because I have so many questions over here talking about, asking about jinn, asking about school, asking about... <laughs> Jazakumullah khair. Just keep it to the topic that we're discussing here, inshallah. Uh, a question comes from Sister Sheikh. It says here, um, in a world where we inhale vast amount of media and become numb to tragedy and imagery, how do we soften our hearts to be able to step back and no longer feel like another robot human just living like uh, um, a life of a robotic steps, that's all? Well, you have to actually expose yourself at a deeper level to something. So. Uh, Scrolling through the images of a hundred different people in devastation is not going to have the effect on your heart that actually sitting with someone who's in devastation is. There are people in your community that are in devastation. There are people sitting here right now that are in a lot of pain. You have friends, you know people that are sick, you know people that are going through hardship. To accompany the grieving is one of the greatest ways to soften your heart and to keep your heart from becoming numb and especially to accompany al-masakeen, al-fuqara wal-masakeen, uh, the, the poor and the downtrodden. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked about a man who had a hardened heart, awsahu an yamsa hara sa yatim, the Prophet ﷺ said, you need to go accompany an orphan. You need to actually go there. You need to be a part of it. I don't know if you guys know this. There are a lot of poor people in Dallas. All right? There are a lot of shelters in Dallas. There are a lot of refugee uh, areas in Dallas. There's a lot here, and wherever you're watching from, there's a lot for you to actually take that step and to go expose yourself to. There are organizations to help instrumentalize that for you. Go accompany people, go be with people. And I'll tell you, subhanAllah, the two most clarifying places in the world. You wanna know the two most clarifying places in the world? The graveyard and a hospital. The two most clarifying places in the world are the graveyard and a hospital. You visit those two places, you're going to find automatically that your heart is, is going to be softened and you're going to have a connection to something more immediate, a greater sense of urgency, a greater sense of, of, of dedication to the night time. And inshallah, we're going to be continuing with these techniques as we come through the night's bin al for us to know how we can acquire that bin al Question from a brother, he says, with knowing that Allah is watching me, yet we make bad, we make bad things. Like we know Allah is watching. We still make bad things. How can I grow Allah's presence and watching in myself? Now, uh, subhanAllah, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal is commanding us uh, uh, to look around. Look within yourself. See the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and he also asks us, sanurihim ayatina fil afaq. Look into the horizons. See the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I personally believe that one of the greatest loss uh, or maybe damage that this civilization uh, took on us human beings really is uh, um, disconnecting us from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almost permanently. Nowadays, if you want to watch the sunrise or sunset, what do you do? You go to YouTube. <laughs> we stop really marveling over these beautiful, beautiful signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We always hear about the beautiful uh, uh, dome of the sky, right? and the stars and all these nice fancy things and so on. But every single night you go out, you look up, you see nothing because of the light pollution, unfortunately. One time I took my kids and my families, we went somewhere far away from, uh, uh, you know, from the light pollution. And 
it, wa it was an interesting thing when I saw my younger daughter actually at the time. She was looking up. She was fascinated by that sight. She's like, wow, Baba, look, look. And I'm in my mind, just like, I know, I know. But unfortunately, one of these uh, damages that this civilization caused us is we disconnect with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything has become uh, manufactured by man. So we think everything is really man-made, including our culture, our lifestyle, our way of thinking, our philosophies. Everything is man right now, man-made stuff. But if you would like to increase that, inshallah, I recommend that people maybe took uh, um, some time out, go into nature, observe Allah's creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala, reflect on that. Even if you do it at home, just sit down there, reflect on Allah's creation, on the ayat of the Quran. Hopefully that will help, inshallah, to barakallah, shaykhna. Yeah, there, there are a few other tips that will actually come that, that uh, speak to this, actually, inshallah ta'ala. So if you'll notice, the 20 techniques are really about um, building greater barriers between you and acting in that impatience on that mm -hmm. lust and building a stronger connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I do want to actually make one point that I don't think shows up in these, in these 20. Um, just because you commit a sin in private doesn't mean you don't love Allah. It means that your lust at the moment is stronger than your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the moment. And it's important for some people to hear that because you might be thinking to yourself, like, man, what a terrible person I am. You know, I still find myself pu pulled to these desires and I still commit this sin over and over again. And subhanAllah, I think about that companion of the Prophet Sallallahu who was drunk and the companions were cursing him. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, don't curse him. He loves Allah and his messenger. Can you imagine him hearing that? He loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love him. And the scholars mentioned that one of the reasons why the Prophet Sallallahu said that was not just to set a principle that, look, just because he fell doesn't mean he doesn't love Allah. But also, it's like when you're being aspirational. Like when Allah says, Ya you alladina amanu, O you who believe, O you who want to be like a full on believer, like you should have something, your ears should perk, O you who believe, that's me. O you who love Allah, that's me. O you who wants to be amongst the truthful, that's me, that, that's me. Like you, you want to hear that and you want to be that person. So can you imagine the impact on that Sahabi when he hears in the midst of his drunkenness, at the lowest point of his life, the companions, like, can you, I mean, how demoralizing would it be to be walking amongst the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, and they're, you know, people are cursing you and putting you down. You're a drunk? Like, really? You live amongst these people and you're a drunk? And the Prophet says, No, you hibbullah wa rasulah. He loves Allah and His Messenger. He just has to build that love to where the love can overcome the lust. It's not that he doesn't love Allah, but the love has to be built to where it's stronger than the pull of the lust. And that's all that it is. Zakhala Khar Shaykh, subhanAllah, I want to add to this point as well. You know, um, people, they expect or they think that uh, amongst us, there will be some people who are completely flawless. They will never commit sins or make mistakes. So they look up to ulama and scholars and students of knowledge and so on, thinking of them that, mashallah, these are the role models that the perfect people I would like to follow. Be careful what you wish for. They're human beings after all. They can make mistakes and they're possibly making mistakes already. However, Sometimes it depends on, on who we are and what we do. Our, our perception of sins is different than one another. So some people, their sins is really in lowly things, very kind of like cheap things. Other people, their sins in subhanAllah and, and other stuff. Uh, and that's why the ulama, the, the ulama sins is just greater than the, what other people they do. So you need to make sure that you understand that, yes, just because I'm making mistakes, I'm trying my best, it doesn't mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is message and uh, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love you. Allah azza wa jalla, if he sees sincerity in the heart, he is willing to forgive. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to remain steadfast, Rabbi Alameen. Shaykh, now quickly for the last question, inshallah, coming from a sister that say, she says, uh, specifically a revert, she says, how to feel connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a revert? Well, I think that one of the things that becomes daunting to someone, especially when they convert to Islam, is that I don't know Arabic yet. I'm still trying to figure out like all of these things. I, don't, I haven't developed the tools of connection to Allah. And the reality is you might be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than everybody else without the tools yet. All these mechanics that we have are meant to grow the love of Allah inside of our hearts and to develop a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why your supplication Supplication is the rawest and most rewardable form of worship. It is. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, 
Supplication is worship. It's the essence of worship. If you learn to call upon Allah when you're alone, if you learn to talk to Allah, you can talk to him in your own language, you can talk to him with the rawest expression, of course with adab, with, with the mannerisms that are befitting, then you can connect to him. You don't have to make dua in Arabic, you don't have to have anything particularly down, memorized, you just need, to, I mean, there, there are etiquettes of, of supplication, but supplication is the key to developing a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the essence of worship. And so for the person that reverts to Islam, in particular a convert, this is a deep means that should overtake all of the desire to, to learn you know, th th these different tools as if they are a prerequisite to having that meaningful connection with God. Jazakumullah khair. I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that you guys uh, uh, found a moment where you can really connect with uh, uh, this conversation that Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah, was having with us in this book. And I highly recommend, inshallah, after we conclude, that you take a moment alone, reflect on these words, try to write them down on your own phone with your own words. See what's your takeaway from this conversation here and what you can put into practice, inshallah. Because as we said, it's all about knowledge and practice. These are two ingredients, he said, will be helpful, helpful for you, inshallah, to find the medicine for all these diseases. The knowledge that you practice, that will strengthen your iman, that will help you build that shield of patience against any atrocity or any calamity. May Allah protect us all from this, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We'll see you tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.